Okay. I'm doing it. Yes. Okay. It's recording. So let me do it again. So all you want to do is to make sure that quantum field theory has the same physics as the quantum mechanics, as long as you're talking about physics where a number of particles doesn't change. So that's why we started with this. We came up with the Hamiltonian for the QFT, starting from the uh, particles of the lattice, which is the continuum limit. Now we're supposed to contain information about external potential particles living, and we're forcing interactions with other particles. And what we like to see is that this QFT Hamiltonian is actually identical to quantum mechanics Hamiltonian for collection of particles. So can I get a for each one of them? And all of them lives in the same external potential. And then it has this repulsive interaction when they come together. So that's that's the thing we would like to see. So they look totally different from each other at the base value, but what we would like to see is that they actually have completely the same physics between QFT Hamiltonian and quantum mechanics Hamiltonian. Yes? Um, I think I remember something. The lambda is the same thing, right? Uh, did I use G? G? The lattice distance? Lattice distance is not lambda. Lambda is the strength of the recursive interaction. Oh, okay. I thought like lambda hard G. So I think what, when I took the, uh, the continuum limit, I first introduced energy U when they overlap the same site. But if we go to normalization, I have to keep this combination constant, and that became lambda, if I remember correctly. Does anyone remember this? Okay. So, lambda, I just kind of understand that if, can I just represent in U over G squared with the delta? Uh, that's right, so U has the dimension of energy, yeah. and G squared uh, uh, has the, um, that doesn't work. I think it's one more for you, not g squared. So that this combination times a delta function, which has dimension of one over distance, uh, has the correct limit. So the lambda uh, over, oops, this has the dimension of one over distance. If you did use this, let me take that. This thing has to have dimension of energy. And this has dimension of one over distance. So this one has dimension of energy times distance. So it should look something like that. Does that make sense? Um, yes, but is that okay to have Yeah, when, when z is set to zero, it looks like lambda goes to zero, but delta function on the other hand, in continuum, is infinite when they uh, come together. So as a product, you get finite energy. So oh, that's the way I consider this continuum. Are those two lambdas the same? Yeah, I, I, mean, I mean that they're the same. What a dimension difference. Um, up here, the Sorry. upper lambda should be ha should have a dimension of energy over the over over length. Let me think. So this times that is number, so that's dimension. Uh -huh. this, this has the dimension of number density, uh -huh. and so this is actually one over d in terms of dimension. So lambda should have dimension of energy times oh, this. Okay. So that's consistent, right? Okay. Is that okay? Can I continue? Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so that's the purpose. What we like to see is that they indeed have the same, not the same physics. And so, the dictionary we want to set up is that if you're talking about multi-particle state in quantum mechanics, this is the wave function which follows the Schrodinger equation. And kinetic energy, as we know, as a rotor operator, and this is dx, and this comes with every particle. Once, 
lambda i k tells us x i minus k acting on this psi. So that's the Schrodinger equation we are familiar with from quantum mechanics. And what we like to see on QMD side is that we build this state at a linear superposition of state where you create particles at these positions x1, x2, and xn on top of the vacuum state. So this way you now have created n particles on top of the vacuum. But then I take a linear superposition of those states weighted by this probability amplitude. And then what I like to do is that by looking at again the Schrodinger equation on the QFT side, then this coefficient which I used to take the linear superposition of the particles created at these positions, satisfied exactly the same equation as the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation. So that is what we would like to see. And what we have done on Wednesday is that by focusing on the case with one particle, we indeed got that, except that we didn't have this interaction term because there was only one particle in the system. So what we're going to do next is focusing now on the case with two particles. Looking at the QFT, this allows you to construct a two-particle state weighted by this arbitrary function capital psi. Add the field theory, I mean, we're going to on it, and write down type derivative of this probability amplitude, and show that that equation is the exactly the same as this one. And that's how we like to be convinced that we haven't changed physics. It's just a different formulation of the same quantum mechanics of identical multi-particle states. It's just that this way of writing it allows you to put all these states with different number of particles into the same Hilbert space, which turns out to be useful later on. So right now, it may look like it's more cluttered than the quantum mechanics. So why, why, why do it? But that actually turned out to be useful, in some cases crucial, when we talk about more physical examples later on. So at least at this stage, we'd like to make sure that we haven't changed physics. It's just a reformulation of the quantum mechanics uh, we, we have already learned in 137. Okay, so that's what we'd like to do. Any, any questions about where we're going? Is it clear? Yes? So would you say that like, quantum field theory uh, w no, quantum mechanics wastes time in like uh, telling which uh, undistinguishable particle is which, whereas in quantum field theory you just care about where the particles are. Uh, that's right. So that's another thing uh, that's a benefit of going to QFT because these psi diagrams commute among each other. Yes. Interchange of positions of these, uh, so said two out of ten particles, doesn't change the state. Therefore, this coefficient function is automatically symmetric under the interchange of any two particles among the n particles. So the quantum statistics is already built in. That's definitely one advantage you already have uh, with beyond quantum mechanics, where you have to really symmetrize the wave function by hand to make sure that they are identical particles. Thank you for asking for the clarifying question. Anything else? Okay, so now that the purpose seems to be clear, let's do it. Okay, so we got this two particle state now. I create particles that position X and Y, and then take linear superposition weighted by this probability amplitude capital psi. And I hope you're getting used to this idea that little psi is an operator, field operator, capital psi is the wave function, so I hope that's getting clear now. Then I take it, I do know what that is. 
And the only time dependence here, we are ensuring a picture, is here, because no operators depend on time. If you go to Heisenberg picture, that's of course different, but right now we are doing Schrodinger picture. So taking time derivative is simply that time derivative acts on this power of the amplitude. And this has to be the same as the QFT Hamiltonian acting on this state. That's a Schrodinger equation. And then comes out of a couple of some algebra. So to avoid the class notations, I'm going to change the uh, integration variable x to z. Separating that piece out, that is easy, but of course comes with x and y integral. Dz. So that's the term in the Hamiltonian. And then I have this creation operator acting on that of the state. And this flow again will be doing capital R. The first thing. I is I write is psi psi dagger as commutator between psi and psi dagger and add that in that piece which has the opposite order in between them. So if I write this commutator out, that's psi psi dagger minus psi dagger psi. And second term is cancelled by the term I added that game, so I haven't changed anything. But that really simplifies the expression because this one is delta x minus z. And then I have the rest, which is psi dagger y, acting on the back of the state. In second piece here, d, sorry, x, d, psi dagger y, zero. But once again, I can do the same trick. Instead of writing this as psi psi dagger, I can turn it to the commutator. But when you do it, you have to add back in the piece which is the opposite ordering of this. But that piece has psi z on the right that acts directly on the vacuum state. So the vacuum states are annihilated because I cannot remove any more particles from the state with no particles in it. So that's identically zero. So replacing it, this product by commutator doesn't change anything. And we know what this is. This is delta function. 
Now that both pieces have delta functions in it, I can do the integral. And looking at the first piece, z is replaced by x everywhere. So this v of z is now x. Psi lag of z is psi lag of x. Psi lag of y acting on the vacuum. That's the first one. And second one has z replaced by y everywhere. So this v is now v of y. This psi dagger is psi dagger of y. I have psi dagger of x here, and 0, and whole thing multiplies this probably the amplitude. And now, this v of x, so this is a tricky point. We used to think v of x is an operator because x is an operator, right? But now, x is a parameter. So this is basically just a number acting on this state. So I can move this v of x all the way to over here. x is just an integration variable. Okay, v of x is number. So I can commute them with all of this stuff and move it over here. And I did the same thing also with this one over here, and I think I made a mistake with one of the z's. This is the other function, this is x. And another thing we know is that psi daggers commute among each other because both of them are creation operators. I can change the orders. Now you find that both pieces have psi dagger x psi dagger y acting on the vacuum state. After changing the order of psi dagger x, psi dagger y acting on the vacuum state. So that's common between them. The only difference between them is that whether it's multiplied by v of x or v of y, When you look at this quantum mechanics wave function that is multiplied by v of xi now sum from one, 1 to 2, so that's v of x plus v of y, and that's what we have over here. Any questions about this? Next thing is, is uh, look at the direction, right? So the next thing we do is instead of having this V of Z, we put in to gain a little bit of space. Let me move this.
So the first piece is delta function. Miss D, there was an F thing on it. We don't have this potential. We have this and that. And the second piece still has this zero as the back thing on the side. And this one is a commutator acting on with the growth acting on it. So then I have this one is still there. Delta function z acting on this one. And the last piece has psi dagger x and delta function with the derivative acting on it. And I still have the is there a delta function missing in the first coefficient? Uh, did I miss something? Oh, that's right. I said I left out the delta function. Thank you. So I have this. And I have that. Look okay? Thank you. So now I'd like to perform z integral. But I have this funny thing that the z derivative is acting on the delta function. So what I have to do then is to do integration by parts so that this z derivative acts on that one instead. Only z dependence in the rest is actually here. So by doing integration by parts, this z derivative now acting on acts on this piece with minus sign. So that delta functions are free of the derivative acting on it. And if you're worried about the surface terms, delta function definitely vanishes if you're away from x. So this is clearly zero. So you don't have to talk about the moon anymore here. And I have the same thing over here. And uh, again, I must be missing something. What did I miss? Ah, I didn't write this one here. Plus h plus two m. So once again, I do the integration by parts. This leader will just act on whatever else is depends on z. This is the only piece that depends on z. So instead of having this, I do that. Okay? Then the delta function is free from the derivative now, so I'm Free, uh, 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 I'm good to do the integration by z. The first line has z replaced by x, which appears in the first term. I have psi dagger y in zero. And the second piece. Now z is replaced by y in psi dagger x, zero. And then I have this coefficient function which depends on x, y, and p. Now this is starts getting uh, uh, closer to what we want. The final thing we do is to do again integration by parts. This one has two x derivatives acting on this field over here. Instead, I like to act this derivative on this coefficient function, which also depends on x. So that the first piece becomes psi dagger x psi dagger y, zero, and now this whole derivative is acting on that one. This time, it doesn't change the sign, 
because I have done integration part by parts twice. That's the first term. Second term, as this derivative acting twice on a field operator, creation operator at position y, I do the same thing. I do integration by parts twice. So these two derivatives now act on that one instead. And I'm free to interchange the order between psi dagger of x and psi dagger y because they are both creation operators. So after the change, it becomes the same thing over here. So at the end of the day, this is what I get. And this now looks the same. As this piece, that is for two parts. So that's the way you see that the QFT Hamiltonian, so far we looked at the uh, first line of the QFT Hamiltonian, correctly reproduces the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian P squared over 2 f in V of x for both particles acting on the wave function. So that's how far we have gotten so far. In the last bit, let's look at the interaction term. Any questions so far? Everything okay? All right. So let's get to the final piece. And second piece here has pi of z together with psi dagger y. So let me be careful. Okay. Uh, so I have so this thing was replaced by that. And I have psi dagger x, psi z, psi dagger y. And this is we play the same trick replace this by the commutator, and the piece with the opposite ordering, the psi of z acting directly on the vacuum state, so that vanishes, so we don't need to keep it. And this is a delta function. Okay, and at this point, we can really do, zoom, really do z integral. First piece has z replaced by x, so this is psi dagger x, psi dagger x, psi of x, psi dagger y. And second piece has z replaced by y. Commentator, this piece becomes 
that was a function, and uh, x was replaced, z was replaced by x, so I should have written this x now. And this piece here, I can also rewrite this to the common period, because I'll put almost an order in that side y acting directly on the back of this thing, so that vanishes. So this piece is a double function. the fact that we have this delta function that x and y have to be the same anyway, I'm allowed to change this x by y without changing anything. And also for the second term, again we have delta x minus y, x and y have to be the same anyway, I can replace this y by x. If I do that, these two terms became the same. So I just cancel back with 2. Then after canceling factor 2, I have left with lambda times delta function. Again, remembering this x and y are parameters, not operators. I can move lambda times delta function all the way to the right. And keep this thing, which is common to both terms, so now you see what you get in the end is that this piece is exactly the same as the way you start out. The only difference is that now this coefficient function is multiplied by the delta function, and that is nothing but the piece over here. And because we have only two particles, the only combination of choosing two particles out of n, which is two, is only one combination between x and y. So now I have all the pieces. Namely that this coefficient we put in for the two is e satisfies exactly the same equation as the quantum mechanical wave function of two particles. So that's a demonstration that QFD will build in the first two weeks as completely identical content as well as physics goes as the two particle quantum mechanical system with two identical particles, so psi by x and y is automatically symmetric between x and y, if you interchange two particles, wave function doesn't change. So that's demonstration that QMT restricted to two particles is completely the same as the quantum mechanics of two particles. And that's the thing we want to verify. So the way we built the quantum field theory, it was a huge jump. We used this uh, the commutationization of free generation operator to create particles, and we tried to make it look as uh, 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 as uh, look the same as the quantum mechanics as possible by identifying this hopping term to be h bar square over two m d squared. 
And then to the continuum level, we also introduce the external potential interactions between particles. So that way of building Hamiltonian probably looked totally different from what we used to in quantum mechanics. But when you look at the context of the theory, it has exactly the same time evolution equation on this coefficient function f of psi, which follows this quantum mechanical Hamiltonian of two identical particles. And if you go to three particles, it's exactly the same idea. And then you just write it. It's just too much algebra to do on the blackboard. But end result is something you can really get by the way. This coefficient function introducing QFT now follows. That's exactly the same thing as the Schrodinger equation for three identical particles in quantum mechanics. So we came from totally different paths, but we are getting exactly the same physics. So that's how we know that we haven't changed physics. We have just reformulated quantum mechanics of identical particles using a new language. But now that you can you have new language which is bigger than the quantum mechanics of individual number of particles. And now that the states with different number of particles are living in the same Hilbert space, you can start talking about real things, like a superposition of a state with two particles and thousand particles, which turns out to be what you need when you talk about Wi-Fi signal right here. Because the Wi-Fi signal you get on your laptop or whatever, is actually the coherent state, which is a linear superposition of states with different number of photons in it. And only when you have a formulation where you have different states with different number of particles in the same Hilbert space, you can take linear superposition of those states to form a coherent state. And that turns out to be the radio signal of uh, what you get on, uh, so on Wi-Fi, 2.4 gigahertz or 5 gigahertz. And so we actually do need it in the end. So the idea here is that as long as you're talking about space with the same fixed number of particles, let me write this again. As long as you're talking about space with spaces in the case of quantum mechanics, you get something totally identical by using space you create on top of the vacuum space using creation operators. And we have verified now that they have identical physics. But the difference is that this is now all contained in a same Hilbert space, so that later on, in the second half of the, of, of the, of the, of the semester, we start talking about processes where number of particles can change. For example, emission of the photon from the excited state of atom. Initially, you have only one electron in, let's say, 2p state of a hydrogen atom. And the, uh, that's the initial state. The final state has an electron in 1s, but additional photon. So in that case, I have electrons in 1, 2, p. The final state has electrons in 1, p plus photon. So I have two particles in the final state. 
And only when you have a formulation where it stayed with one particle and it stayed in two particles, lived inside the same Hilbert space, you can talk about this transition and we will compute that. So I'm just repeating myself, quantum mechanics and QFT are identical as long as you are dealing with fixed number of particles, but because we will need to talk about a process where number of particles can change, we will need to talk about linear superposition of states with different number of particles, we have to go to QFT to describe that kind of situation, which you can never do in quantum mechanics. So that's the main message here. Any questions? Yes. So, first of all, um, so we have we have uncertain about the multiple particle system in quantum mechanics, and now in quantum field theory, we try to add um, prime data huh? of different positions onto the vacuum state. Right. So, my question, the first question will be: Is the vacuum state a unique state? Because it's I'd like to make sure I remember all three. So the first question was the uniqueness of the vacuum state. I think I can raise now. And the answer to the question turns out to be it depends. so far actually has unique vacuum state because of the following reason. We started out with one dimensional lattice and the vacuum state was defined to be a state where there are no particles in the system, which means when I act A at position one, it vanishes, do the same thing in position two, position three, So what we are doing here is that this zero is meant to be the ground state of the harmonic oscillator at every position, right? So this condition is satisfied by getting A1 act on zero one. This condition is satisfied when A2 acts on zero two, and so and so forth. And they correspond to different sets of harmonic oscillators. So that's why I can commute A2 with a state 0, 1, so that they act directly on 0, 2, and so on and so forth. So the vacuum state we define is unique because it's just tensor product of the ground state of harmonic oscillator at each position. So it is unique. But we will see a situation when it's not because what we might zero, you have to define it. So far we are talking about the zero state to be a state with no particles. But in the end, what we really need is actually the ground state of the system. When, when you have interactions among particles, so in some cases, the ground state may have bunch of particles in it for a given system. So in that situation, then this may not be unique because you can either put, let's say you have you end up with the ground state with two particles, two particles this way, that way, or this way, and so on. 
And so the vacuum state may not be unique. So the meaning of the word vacuum is something you have to define. And in most cases, what we mean by this cat zero is supposed to be the ground state, because that's something you need to understand, instead of vacuum state, which is defined by this condition. So this state with no particles is unique, but the ground state may not be. So that's why I said it depends. So the vacuum state we talked about so far was really a state with no particles in it, Hence, it has always been unique, but we will talk about systems where ground state of the system may have many particles in it. In that kind of situation, then the ground state may not be unique, hence it depends. So that's the answer to your first question. Did I answer your question? Yes, I have a follow-on question. Okay. Um, but um, for a system of particles, mm -hmm. like sometimes the ground state is not necessarily uh -huh. So, uh, the, the problem is that we cannot use the physical mechanics of K, you know, of, of, uh, we cannot use the ground state to determine things in reality because there is a difference because it's, it's the ground state is not the equilibrium state. Uh, that's a tricky question. The ground state is defined to be an eigenfield of Hamiltonian with lower energy. Yes. An eigenfield of Hamiltonian is a stationary state. So I don't quite understand what you mean when it's not in equilibrium. Uh, and I'm not even talking about ensemble yet. Okay. Yeah. So can you postpone that question for now? Sure. And the, your second question was? Uh, if I'm interested in the surface, then I cannot draw the ah, surface. So when you're interested in surface, of course, then you also have to specify the system a little bit more detail. Because if your space has an end, that's what people, ancient people used to think that our, so our Earth is flat. If you go up there, there is actually a pole, and, and that's where the land ends. But that's not true, right? So you have to specify the boundary condition in that case. When, when you consider a surface, suppose you have one electron here, what does it do? Does it bounce back? Or can it escape into, let's say, a wire? That's a natural system. So you have to do something more. You need more information about what the boundary of the system actually is. And when you make sure that the electrons will never escape, and you put a hard wall here, in that case, wave function has to always vanish on the end. So again, there's no surface term. On the other hand, if the system can allow the, uh, the, allow the electron to escape, then you have to attach this wire. And this has to become part of your Hamiltonian. So you just extended your space, and end of the space is end of that wire. And at the end of the wire, you still have to specify how wire is connected to something else. So in some sense, this issue of surface can be indefinitely postponed. So at the end of the day, again, you don't have to care much about the surface, as long as you specify the boundary condition of the system. And the third question was long range potential. Now I remember that, okay. And that's a good question too. So, so far we talked about the Hamiltonian where quantum mechanics were doing. Has only short range repository potential. And uh, that's the simplest case, uh, case of interaction I could talk about, that's why I use that one. But in principle, you would like to also have a situation like this. And now that there are two Vs going on, so let me say this is the external potential, where all the particles live in. And this is the internal potential that describes the interaction among particles in the system. So the question is, how do we describe that in QFT? And you can sort of guess. So this piece is the same.
because this piece is what ended up giving you the kinetic energy for each particle. This piece also remains the same. Because that actually gave us this external potential. Now we have to think about this piece, which depends on two potentials. That can be written in the following way. And at least you can do a cross check when it changes the internal potential, interaction potential, back to delta function. If this is a delta function between x and y, then I can perform y integral. I end up with only x integral in the end, but then all of these field operators are now at the same position as x. That's exactly the QFT Hamiltonian we had, which may be gone by now. Yep, it is gone, but hopefully you do remember it. So this becomes delta function, I take it y, so this is gone. I have lambda over 2, psi lambda x, psi lambda x, psi x, psi x. And that's a situation you had before. But if the interaction potential is long range, then two positions are separated now. And if you don't worry too much about ordering between the equation relation operator, psi lambda x, psi x, is basically the number density of particle at position x. Psi lambda y, psi y, is the number density of particle at position y. If you think of this as sort of continuous medium of fluid or something, then that's precisely the way you would write the energy of the fluid that has long range interactions among pieces. So that would be sort of the classical version of this. But now that we have quantum mechanics, the quantum field theory said, you have to be careful about ordering between these operators. And this way of writing it turns out to be the correct ordering, which reproduces the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian of the piece uh, that term you are familiar with. So if you're thinking about, for example, multi-electron app, all the electrons live in the same external potential coming from the Coulomb potential from the nucleus, and every electron has a Coulomb repulsion with every other electron. So this will be the Coulomb repulsion term. And that's the system you're looking at. And that can be now described also by QFT, just by including this overall nuclear Coulomb potential right here, and the Coulomb repulsive potential among electrons over here. And then you can go through the same exercise and show that this QFT once restricted uh, the subspace with definite number of particles, would give you identical Schrodinger equation as the quantum mechanical version. And so that still remains the same. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. Anybody else? Yes. Uh, um, you, you first. Um, I have a, it's a very late question. When we're dealing the net terms uh, of the equations, yeah, we, uh, we we have done something like uh, we move the Laplacian that was originally act on the psi dagger x, psi dagger y to uh, to the phi, and and this you mean uh, you you said that we integral by uh, integral by parts for two times then we get that, but I essentially I figure it's just like the green equality in electrodynamics, right? Uh, because. Um, we can use the green, uh, can I write it down? Oh, it's, sure. it's very quick. Oops, there's nothing here. Uh, can I have you erase something? Uh, which was the previous? I think this, this can be erased. Essentially, we have 
um, base equality and with integral base integral equals um, on the surface we had this is a, a integral on the surface and this is the integral on the body okay is that correct so um, we look at this if we oh sorry I got something wrong uh, it should be it should be a minus so if this term becomes zero then we can say um, the Laplacian could act on this equals the Laplacian act on the former term okay but it, it's exactly the same thing as here yeah yeah got you. so and, and we can see that we just drop this huh? term into zero and for uh, similarly we can define some term for this case which is uh, this is this should be oh, sorry no no square and this multiplied by a five and and what's worse so we had five here and uh, oh yeah. This is a vector equation. So, and this is exactly look like a flow. Yeah, so you can so it's the same thing, right? The so surface thing line here is how much probability leaks out from the surface. Yes. And we are assuming that basically that's, that there's no surface term. So well, this, uh, this doesn't, because this deal is the uh, parameter x and y. Uh -huh. So it doesn't mean anything physical. Because um, we drop this term because we think this flow integral on the surface should be zero. Right. And why is that? Because uh, this goes zero and this goes to zero two on the boundary. Well, that's one way to do it. So if you put, put a hot boundary, uh -huh. Then the particle should not go to the edge, they bounce back. So the effect of sign uh, would vanish at the boundary. Yeah. So that's the situation where you can really safely drop effect of psi at the boundary. Yeah, but more interesting, uh, I'm more interested about whether this um, term express some sort of physical meaning like uh, probability flow, and but it deals with two parameters, so it's not like a particle, one particle or a bunch of particles flow out of the boundary. Well, the physical meaning is the same thing, except that because they are all identical particles now in QFT, you can't talk about X particle, Y particle. You can oh. only talk about sort of particles as a whole escaping at infinity. Oh, so these two just two down indices, right? That's right. Yeah. Oh, so this is, and just to make sure, and this express exactly the probability flow on boundary. Uh huh. Oh, okay, thank you. Yep. Good. And you had a question. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, I'm wondering, uh, uh, I believe the vacuum stain looks the same for different observer, but uh, it's, does it hold for ground state? Because you, you said uh, ground state ha has a, lot, a bunch of particles. Does it look the same in different inertial brand? Yeah, so we will actually talk about that, that the, the question as the next subject. So. Like, if you just wait just a little bit, then you will see an example, so we can uh, talk about this much more concretely. Okay. Okay. Anybody else questions at this stage? All right. So can I finish this part of the question? And now we'll get to then precisely that question of having ground state for small to hard. Gas is so diluted 
to compute the typical distance among the uh, atoms, then the range of interaction is negligible. So in that, state, in that situation, this delta function is a good approximation of the system, so I use that one, just because it's simpler. And I also make another simplification, exponent potential is just constant. And once you replace the external potential by constant, there's a meaning of the chemical potential. And chemical potential, if you have taken that neck, appears in your grand canonical ensemble. Your potential function sums over all states with Hamiltonian, but also with a different number of particles in the system. And this is something you do in step mech when you have a reservoir. And this is your system where particles can go in and out of the system between the system and the reservoir, the number of particles in your system is not fixed, then you use this grand canonical ensemble weighted by the number of particles in the exponent, and this parameter u is what is called chemical potential. And because of the sine plus, which is opposite from the sine in the Hamiltonian, that's the same thing as putting this negative mu as the external potential. So this has the meaning that when you put additional particle into your system, you gain energy mu. If you put two particles, you gain energy two mu. If you lose one particle, then you lose energy mu. But mu can be also be negative. So depending on a situation where mu can be either positive or negative, and if you're talking about typical system where you have some you know, pressure, uh, the gas in a pressure, then moving particle out of the system typically makes the system a little bit more easier, and therefore you actually gain energy. So in that situation, the chemical potential is actually negative. That's sort of a normal situation. If you're, for example, looking at the air in this room, chemical potential is negative. On the other hand, when you are talking about a system at very low temperatures, and you have gas that repels itself, and in order to keep certain number of particles in the system, then you have to sort of work against this repulsive force. So you need to put in an incentive to keep certain number of particles in the system that will require positive chemical potential. So that keeping particle inside give you, basically, you gain energy by doing so. So when you're talking about system typically at very low temperatures, and with repulsive interactions among them, then you need to keep the chemical potential positive. So we will be dealing with two cases where chemical potential is negative. That's sort of a normal case for us. And then go to the case where chemical potential is positive, where you start seeing something weird. But as far as QFT goes, we haven't really changed anything, right? We are still talking about the particles, which can move with kinetic energy P square root 2m. They have this repulsive delta function potential along each other. Then you just have added additional piece in the Hamiltonian that has the meaning of chemical potential, which is just how much incentive you need to keep a particle inside your system. So let's see what happens with that. He's a reader uh, for a class, so he will be grading your homework. And he has taken this course actually last year. It was all Zoom last year, but anyway, so he was one of those best students in the class, so it's, it's really great to have him as a reader for this class. So just say hello.
<laughs> All right, so let's start with a normal situation. The mu is negative. So this case is very simple because when you have a system with this piece in the Hamiltonian, because mu is just a constant, I can factor that out. And you remember, remember it that psi dot of psi was a continuous version of a dagger a, right? So I, we went from this one to that one. So this just counts not all particles at each site, added over the sites, which is just the total number of particles in the system. So what that means is that your Hamiltonian has a piece which is negative mu n. And we are saying that mu is negative now. So this is mu absolute value n. Which then means that fewer the particles, the lower the energy. And the number of particles cannot be less than zero. You can't talk about negative one particle. So n is limited by zero, basically. So then you can find that in this case, ground state corresponds to the state which has no particles in it. So the vacuum state we talked about so far, which is annihilated by annihilation operator at every position, is the ground state in this case. So that's why you know, we used to think about the ground state being the vacuum state without thinking much about it. But now that you ask the question, of course, that is actually a non-trivial question to ask. And as long as chemical potential is negative, it does turn out the vacuum state is indeed the ground state. So that sort of justifies what we have been assuming implicitly. So that kind of makes sense. If you have no particles, there's no energy, and that's the ground state of the system. So the only interesting thing happens to this system when chemical potential is actually positive. Then something different would happen. The vacuum state may no longer be the ground state of the system. Then you have to think about that. What happens in that case? So just switching the signs sounds like a sort of a simple change, but the first thing I have to tell you is that nobody knows the ground state. It's an interactive system, and nobody knows what exactly the ground state is. But it turns out that when you actually have infinite system with infinite number of particles in it, you can at least have an approximate Okay. 
which turns out to be the coherent state. And this approximation is justified by using a variational method. And have you done variational method in 137? So then you know what I'm talking about. So you basically come up with a hundred of the ground state with certain parameter in it. Then you evaluate expectation variable on the point end. So you have some trial and which has certain set of problems in it, you evaluate expectation values with respect to these problems, and then you minimize potential energy uh, energy with respect to all of these problems, and then put the solution back into this. Which turns out to be approximately ground state of the system. So we use this idea because we don't know what the exact solution is. We come up with approximate solutions using this method. And doing that, it turns out that ground state of the system is a pretty good coherent state, which is now a very bizarre idea because we are talking about a coherent state of QFD, not harmonic oscillator here. And as might you probably remember, the coherent state was defined by the sum of state with different number of particles now. The normalization factor. So this is where QFT becomes essential. We are talking about linear superposition of states with different number of particles. And on this state below the same Hilbert space, you can't take such a weird object. But now you can, because it's in with QFT. And using this idea, you can minimize the energy to come up with an approximate ground state that actually turns out to be precisely this, namely the coherent state. So what I'm telling you is something really weird. If you have this dilute gas of atoms with repulsive potential among each other, but if you go to low temperature, you need to provide incentive so to keep the particle inside your box, which means you need to put in positive chemical potential. The minute you put in a positive chemical potential, you can't solve the system exactly, but you can do so approximately. And the end result turns out to be a state which has a linear superposition of different number of atoms in it. And that is a phenomenon which is called Einstein condensate, you probably heard about. Or BEC for short. So we will be talking about this today also maybe uh, uh, next week. But the idea, what you have to do to come up with ground state is very simple. So as long as you're talking about this infinite system, system is presumably uniform. And now we're talking about the field theory coherent state. This is the annihilation operator. So we are talking about eigenstate of the annihilation operator. That's the definition of the coherent state. In principle, eigenvalue can be different from one place to another. But assuming the system is uniform, I set this to be constant. That's pretty simple. Either way, it's the same thing. So nothing changes from one place to another. 
then this eigenvalue should be the same from one place to another. So I assume system is in this coherent state, which is an eigenstate of the annihilation operator at every position with the same eigenvalue. That's the ansatz. And now we compute the implication.
so, so this, this, this can be said only within this approximation method of creation. We can have a white Thank you. 